All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is a very special presentation at American IRA. Anytime we have a guest that can uh, shed some light on some interesting topics, it's always a big win for us and for our clients and potential clients. So uh, today is certainly one of those opportunities. This is the ins and outs of hotel investing. And we're very lucky to have with us Mr. Michael Glaspie. He is the co-founder and CFO of Archimedes International. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, we were introduced via a mutual friend in the Charlotte market, another real estate entrepreneur, and uh, just having uh, the opportunity to have a few conversations with Michael. He's certainly an incredibly sharp real estate entrepreneur. He's involved in a variety of different types of projects. And again, uh, this is an opportunity for us to have a guest expert speak on in this case, the topic of hotel investing, which is certainly something that I know absolutely nothing about. So this will be a tremendous opportunity for a, uh, a value add discussion here. And so in looking at the registrants, we do certainly have a lot of non-clients at American IRA that have registered and are listening to us live. So the way the presentation will work today is we'll spend the first probably 10 minutes just kind of going through the idea of self-directed retirement accounts, which is our service at American IRA. And then we'll turn it over for the main event so that Michael can teach us about some of the fundamental aspects of how to think about hotel investing and uh, so we do have a little bit of uh, time constraints today, so we'll, we'll try and make a bit of time for Q&A, but we'll also have Michael's contact information, ways to reach out to him. Uh, so if you're interested in the strategy, if you're looking to uh, get more information about how this world of hotel investing works, uh, we can certainly direct you to those platforms so that you can engage with Michael after the uh, after the presentation. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and delve right into it. So when we talk about retirement accounts, really historically, when we think about IRAs and 401ks, investors tend to think that they need to have their retirement accounts tied to the stock market. They think they have to invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And the reality is, is that that's not true. At American IRA, the real focus of our investors is investing in what are considered alternative assets. And there's really two primary reasons for that. The first is that for most investors, they don't necessarily understand the stock market as well as they understand other opportunities. Maybe it's precious metals. Maybe it's investing in real estate opportunities. So really with a self-directed account, ultimately we're just giving you the opportunity to invest in what you understand and what you believe is going to give you the best rate of return on your investment dollar. Now, the second reason that so many people are moving towards these self-directed retirement accounts is that not only is the stock market confusing, but if you look at the way that the stock market investments are constructed, there's really typically very little cash flow that we receive from those investments in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And so ultimately in our retirement years, that forces us to have to just simply sell off assets so that we can get to those chunks of money to pay for our bills and to hopefully do some fun stuff as well. Now, conversely, when you look at other investments such as real estate, the cash flow from real estate is historically so much better than what we see in the stock market that allows you to have more flexibility with your portfolio. Maybe you're not going to have to actually sell off your assets. Maybe you can simply live off the cash flow so that you're not worried about essentially running out of money in your retirement years. So there's just a lot of flexibility given to us when we're able to go beyond just simply stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Now, all that to say, we do specialize in alternative assets, but clients do still have the capacity to fully diversify their portfolio. So if you are interested in at least some part of your portfolio being invested in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, you can also make those investments with us at American IRA. So when we say a self-directed account, really there's two components to understand. The first is, as the name indicates, these are retirement accounts 
where you as the account holder are picking the investments. They are truly self-directed. Now the second part is as we alluded to, these are retirement accounts where you can invest in anything essentially under the sun as long as it's not collectibles and life insurance policies. So you can invest in picking your own index funds, individual stocks, etc. You can also invest in real estate, in debt instruments such as mortgages, and also privately held companies, which we're certainly seeing more and more of. Maybe there's someone in your community that's starting a business or they're looking to take that business to the next level. You can invest in those opportunities. So at American IRA, we're actually one of the very few self-directed providers that is what is considered a fully integrated self-directed firm. And what that means is we have the same ownership group for American IRA, which is the administration company, as we do for New Vision Trust Company, which is our parent custodian. And so really the reason why that's a benefit to you as a client is you're going to have consistency in the way the underwriting is done and the way that your account is processed. Because if you're reliant on a third party custodian, things can change very quickly in our industry. And many times what you find over the years is that you'll actually need to hop from custodian to custodian based upon the changes in their interest of business models, et cetera. So we're able to stay really solid in our business model being that we are a fully integrated company. And if you haven't checked out our other webinars, we have a really incredible competitive advantage when it comes to fees for our clients. With most self-directed providers, you're paying a higher annual fee each year as your account balance grows. With our model, we believe it's unfair for us to get to charge you more fees because you've made positive investment decisions. So our baseline annual fee for our IRAs is capped at $285 a year. Conversely, most of the firms in our industry cap their annual fee alone at two to $3,000 a year. So obviously a huge, huge savings there at American IRA. We're also very different in that we were founded and run by entrepreneurs and investors. So we're not just speaking theoretically, which is shockingly kind of the norm in our industry. We're actually run by a group of entrepreneurs that understand these investments and these asset classes. So I believe there's always gonna be more value when you're working with vendors and relationships that they actually understand what you're going through. So when we look at these self-directed accounts, try to keep in mind really any type of IRA or 401k can potentially be self-directed. Certainly any IRA is definitely eligible to be self-directed. So whether it's a Roth, a traditional, a SEP, a simple IRA, maybe you have a Coverdale educational account or a health savings account. If you have a current employer sponsored plan, like a 401k, a 403b, or a thrift savings plan, typically you have to wait until you're no longer employed at that firm to be able to move that to another financial services provider but it's always worth asking someone in your human resources department or perhaps the current custodian of that plan to see if there's any ability to roll over funds or to do an in-service distribution but the retirement accounts themselves are not changing forms in any way shape or form so you have the same ability to make contributions each year the same ability to take distributions from the retirement accounts. The mechanics of these accounts are identical, whether they're quote unquote self-directed or not. So as I mentioned earlier, the way the IRS code is written is it tells us that we cannot invest in collectibles or life insurance policies. So this list that you see here is by no means a complete list of what can be done, but certainly some of the most typical investments that we see from clients on a daily basis. So obviously Michael's our expert on real estate concepts and especially uh, kind of the, the larger commercial world with hotel investments. So th that'll certainly be the focus here today, but any type of real estate can be acquired by your IRA or 401k. So whether it's raw land, condos, townhomes, single family homes, all the way up to those larger commercial deals. So apartment complexes, retail spaces, and hotel investments, they can be made inside of your retirement account as well. 
Now, most typically what we see for the larger scale investments like a hotel investment, a syndication for a hotel, is that you're going to see a group of investors coming together, usually for a single purpose LLC, and that LLC will actually own the asset. It'll own the hotel, for example. And so a retirement account can be a member, it can be one of many investors that are involved and essentially have a partial ownership in that hotel investment. So a lot of opportunities available to us with these retirement accounts. As you see here, there's obviously investments such as precious metals, tax liens, as we mentioned earlier, privately held companies, we're starting to see more and more of our clients are investing in digital assets as well, such as Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera. So again, as long as it's not collectibles or life insurance policies, it can typically be structured. So before we turn it over to Michael, so whether it's hotel investments or purchasing a single family house that's going to be a rental property for your retirement account, there's really three fundamental strategies that we can employ when our retirement account is looking at purchasing a piece of real estate. It can first be where the retirement account is the sole owner of the asset. So in option number one, the IRA or 401k, it's the sole owner and it's simply paying cash for the asset. So the single family house, the larger commercial deal, et cetera. Option number two is where the retirement account is going to joint venture. It's going to be one of multiple investors involved in a potential purchase. So as we mentioned with hotels, unless you have somebody with a very, very large checkbook, typically you're going to see a group of investors coming together to participate in that deal. So again, the IRA or 401k can be one of those investors that gets involved in a more expensive or a larger type of real estate investment. And option number three is where the IRA or 401k is actually going to borrow money for the acquisition of the asset. So it needs to be a very specific type of loan called a non-recourse loan. So usually on syndication deals, we see that there are these essentially lead investors. There are these managers for that LLC. And with that, the managers and a certain group of investors are uh, guaranteeing the debt if there is a guarantee on the debt that they're getting from the institution. And then the other investors are considered more the passive investors in that opportunity. And so in that case, the retirement account would not be guaranteeing the debt that that group of investors is acquiring to make the investment into the commercial real estate deal. So option number three is the ability to use leverage, either as a sole owner or as a group of investors coming together. So again, as I said, we're very, very lucky to have with us today, uh, Michael Glaspie. He's going to add a lot of value as we look at this really kind of unique idea of investing in hotels. This is not something that we've covered previously. So I'm really excited to learn about this as well today. Uh, so Michael, are you with us? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, perfect. So uh, I've, I've at least attempted to hand over the controls. So uh, hopefully you can take it from there. All right, let me give it a test run here. Yep, all right, we're good to go. Perfect. So thanks again, Sean, uh, for having me and uh, welcome everybody who's attending. Um, to give you a little background about me, I spent about 10 years in the military. Um, that entire time, I was looking for alternative ways to invest, to find another uh, avenue outside of active income. And the game of investing, as we all know, is how can we make our money work for us so we don't have to exchange our time for money. And as I've grown through the years, uh, we have a brokerage, you know, I've invested in several multifamily properties, single family properties over the years. And then me and my partners uh, started Archimedes International, where we focused on a very unique opportunity through hotel investing. So today we're going to talk about hotels and how they are a little bit different uh, than real estate, but all in all the same, okay? So here's our agenda for today. We're gonna talk about the hotel investing overview, exactly what is a hotel, what are some of the differences between hotels, what makes a Red Roof Inn different from a Marriott, things of that nature. 
why we actually honed in on hotels as an opportunity, how we then find opportunities to invest, and then how do we actually analyze the fundamentals of the cash flow? And then what is the difference, again, between hotels and something like an apartment building, and you'll be shocked that there's not much difference at all. And then how you, as an investor, can seek out opportunities yourself to invest. All right. So I am pretty interactive, typically, in my, in my teaching. So I might ask a lot of, a lot of uh, hypothetical questions here and pause a little bit. But that's meant to kind of really encourage you to think about some of these questions. All right. Um, and I also have a very extensive real estate background. So most of the uh, reference points I'll be using will be different aspects of real estate analysis and things like that to really kind of drive the, uh, the point home. Now, some of you may not have a real estate background, but you may have a very uh, uh, more understanding of business, right? Profit and loss statements, financial statements and things of that nature. And so I'll try to uh, go back to that as well so everybody can follow along. So started off with what is a hotel, right? And I always like to uh, put, you know, address the elephant in the room, right? Hotel versus motel. I get this question very often. And although there isn't really a scientific difference, a motel is something that is going to be a little bit more commonly seen on the side of a highway, maybe one to two floors. And you typically have the access into the rooms on the exterior of the building. It's very common, okay? A hotel, think of something as maybe a, a welcoming lobby, an elevator, stairs. It could be as big as, you know, 10, 20 stories, multiple rooms, couple hundred rooms. That's the idea of a hotel. Now, there's nothing wrong with motels. And matter of fact, a lot of the fundamentals that we're going to cover, you can use to evaluate a motel as well. We just decided to focus on hotels very specifically because we found that there's a somewhat of a stigma um, with motels that's not necessarily viewed in a positive light by the majority of the population, right? There's still, still a very uh, a niche market that has no issues using the motel and if that's the market you want to focus on then that's absolutely fine we just decided to focus on hotels okay so let's talk about hotel types now when you're looking at hotel types there are several different ways that you can actually classify hotels i apologize guys about the slides here i <laughs> still working with this uh there we go i think i got it okay all right there's several different ways that you can actually classify hotels. Um, one of the ways you can do it is just doing it by size, okay? Number of rooms, right? You know, say under 200 or above 700. That's a very common way when investors come in, they say, you know, what are some of the criteria? Size count or size of the property may actually be an aspect. Another very common uh, uh, classification would be the target markets. Right. And so you'll hear things like airport hotels, business hotels, extended stay, resorts, right? All these other things, casinos, things like that, where it's very clear who your target audience is and where that asset should more than likely be located. All right. Now, in addition to that, another classification, the ones are the two that we truly focus on in our company is the level of service and the type of ownership. For us, that's a little bit more important. So we're open to business hotels, extended stays, and things of that nature, as long as they fall into the other two categories. So with the level of service, you can think of them as uh, how many amenities or services are actually provided to the client, to the customer, okay? And world-class services, that just means just that, right? Let's talk about uh, spa treatment within the hotel, um, dry cleaning treatment, room service, things of that nature, okay? That's world-class service. Very unique market. It's typically a higher income, higher discretionary income target market, um, more luxurious locations, okay? Then you have your mid-range services. This can be considered something like a Marriott right or a hilton where it's it still is affordable but you have many more services than just the simple continental breakfast right yes you may have room service you may have a laundry facility or some dry cleaning in there you may have a snack uh location a restaurant a coffee shop all kind of internal to the hotel that's mid-range and then you have limited services and you see it's bolded there 
because that's what we like to focus on. Limited services, maybe something that just has the continental breakfast and that's it, right? It may have a laundry facility, but it may be uh, coin operated or card operated. So the expense is passed on to uh, the customers, right? It may not have dry cleaning limited services and we'll get into a lot of the reasons why we focus on limited services but you can quickly see how complex you know a profit and loss statement can be if you're looking at multiple streams of revenue right on a world-class service for example versus something like limited services we have primarily one stream of income it will be the room rentals, right? And we'll get into that in a little bit later. But we chose to stick to something that's going to be a lot easier to maintain and find those operational inefficiencies to make that investment a little bit better, okay? And the next one there is the ownership and affiliations. So you can think of these three class or subclassifications as how is it actually owned and operated? So an independent hotel would be just that. It's independent of any national franchise. This is not going to be your, your best Western. This is going to be something like, you know, Mike owns this branded as X. A very good example of this would be anybody who has taking trips to vacation destinations, beachfronts, mountain ranges, things of that nature, and you find a nice little boutique hotel that may be owned and operated by, you know, maybe a mom and pop, somebody who retired and decided that this was their dream to own a bed and breakfast. That's a good example of an independent hotel. Now, how that differs from a single or private, own, privately owned is a privately owned uh, series of hotels may still have their own brand, right? But they may have scaled a little bit. Maybe they have 10 locations, you know, five locations, 20 locations, but they're not a national brand. They're not spread across state to state or even international at that. Whereas that last one, and again, you see it's bolded, is the chain and the franchise model of the hotels. All right, now this is your Red Roof Inns, your Best Westerns, your, your Hiltons, your Marriott's, right? Things that have a standard practice or like we in the military like to call it a standard operating procedure of how the hotel should be functioned, branded, kept, you know, all of those good things. And again, we'll talk about this one a lot, but understanding again, like Sean mentioned in the beginning, when we're investing, we're not trying to start another business. We're trying to find a place for our money to work for us. And one of the simplest ways to do that in a hotel model is by using a franchise model or an operating system that is already set in place and almost automates the operation of the company. Okay, so that's why we focus on those. And so now let's dig in a little bit deeper to why we focused on limited service chain or franchise hotels. So one of the biggest ones is brand recognition. We already talked about the operating procedures and all that great stuff, but brand recognition. Think about it. It's human nature to be creatures of habit. Once we know we like something, we go back to it over and over and over again. Whether it's your favorite soda with Coca-Cola or your favorite hotel. If you know that you like Best Westerns because it's the most affordable, cleanest environment, great service, you're going to look for a Best Western regardless if you're in Louisiana, Arkansas, or Washington. Okay, So brand recognition is extremely important to understand. The next thing there is we touched on it briefly, but the majority of the revenue and limited services is generated through room rentals, not through, um, you know, spa treatments and not through room service and things of that nature. It's primarily generated through room rentals, which reduces the metrics that we have to focus on for evaluating value. OK, and we'll get into that on, a, on another slide of how we actually run those numbers to come up with valuation or valuations and see where we can improve operational efficiency. Lower overhead is huge. So let's think about it. Even if we did offer uh, dry cleaning and room service throughout the night, although that may increase revenue in some aspects, it also increases overhead. If the dry cleaning facility was on site, that's already a major capital expense that we would have to 
input into the uh, into the actual project, but also to maintain it, right? To maintain that facility. And if it was offsite, well, then we'd still have to worry about transportation and actually creating a profit margin over the uh, the third party's fees, right? So there is more overhead with those additional revenue sources. So by focusing on limited service, we've actually reduced our overhead. Reduced liability is the same aspect. And once you start to have many different cogs on the wheel, right, as far as different revenue streams or services provided, all that does really is open up the business for more opportunities to expose themselves to liability, okay, for many different reasons. So we found that we can reduce our liability by only focusing on a few metrics. Less volatile cash flows. Now, some of you may or may not be aware that hotel rentals are extremely seasonal, especially due to their, or depending on their geographical location, okay? So for example, uh, hotels on a beachfront will be extremely popular and highest uh, daily rates are gonna be during the summer, springtime, things where they're frequently uh, visited. Same concept if that same hotel was found in a mountain ski resort location right? During the winter, those is when it's going to be highest, right? Maybe not so much in the summer. So understanding once you have the flow of the seasonality for that specific hotel, you can predict the cash flow fairly uh, securely understanding what your uh, annual vacancy rates usually are. It's not as dependent on how many individuals are going to be seeking the uh, delivery service to the room or the dry cleaning, so forth and so on, right? So it becomes a lot less volatile because it's much easier to predict over the course of time. And then lastly, but probably most importantly for us as we started to venture in, the components are extremely similar to apartment investing, which made it very easy to understand, digest, and then turn around and bring in our investors and our limited partners into the, into the fold because it was something that we could understand and articulate, right? And as you all are aware, Warren Buffett says it best, you don't invest in anything that you don't understand, right? And so by understanding the aspects of hotel investing with limited service model, it makes it much easier to move forward. All right, still working on this slide, there we go. All right, so now how do you find opportunities? All right, finding opportunities is the key to actually becoming successful in this, because obviously there are plenty of hotels for sale, but anybody who's been in real estate uh, for more than a day, you know that finding the deal is often the hardest, right? Especially once you start to have capital or access to capital, finding the deal is one of the biggest challenges out there because you can go onto the open market, but everybody wants to charge a premium. Right. So we try to find off market deals by following the the, uh, the upcoming steps here. So first off, you have to identify your ideal market and location. And when we say market, we're, we're talking about do you want to cater to business professionals? Do you want to cater to uh, vacation goers? Do you want to cater to uh, military travel? Right. Once you kind of understand that ideal market. Well, then you can tie it to a location. For example, if you wanted to cater towards vacation goers, you may not want something in Atlanta, Georgia, right? Per se. Atlanta, Georgia may be a better spot for business travelers, for corporate travelers, okay? So once you identify what target you're really going for, then you can focus on the location. Now, as you're probably aware, in a central metropolitan area such as Atlanta, such as Charlotte, North Carolina, the premiums for these properties are gonna be astronomical, right? Everybody's gonna be asking for the highest price because it's so desirable, and we have so many institutional investors looking to get into these marketplaces. So it's probably gonna be hard for a smaller investor like ourselves to actually get in and be competitive in a large MSA. So we can start to look at the secondary and tertiary markets around these areas. When we do, we wanna make sure that they're along highly traveled routes, right? We don't want them off into the boondocks because when people are looking for hotels, they're looking for convenience, right? Location to amenities, stores, restaurants, 
uh, movie theaters, the, their actual destination. If they're coming in town for a conference, they don't want to be 45 minutes away from the conference, right? So we have to look for different um, factors like that. Now, once we found the ideal markets and general locations, now we have to find the distressed properties or the owners, okay? Just like in, in all things, there are people who may have accidentally fell into a hotel property or who have just become overstretched, maybe tired of operating. Maybe they're an independent operator and they bit off more than they can chew or they really don't know the hotel asset class that well. So you start to see that the performance of the asset is not up to industry norms, right? It's distressed, whether it's the condition, the property, or just the owners themselves. Maybe they're going through a hard time. Once we find opportunities like that, it opens up the gate for us to acquire the property creatively. We may not need to come in with a brand new loan, a whole bunch of capital, we may be able to do some sort of seller carry back, seller financing, loan assumption, and we'll talk about acquisition here in a little bit, but identifying those distressed opportunities is gonna be key. Then you wanna look at the asset class opportunity, okay? Now again, I bolded limited service simply because that's what our company, company focuses on, but we have to talk about taking something that may not be being used in that sense, and seeing if there's an opportunity to transition it over to that. So let's say that you specifically wanted to invest in luxury, right? And let's say you wanted to upfit everything, you wanted to provide world-class services in your vicinity. When you start to look at the property, and let's say it is a limited service, let's say it's a red roof inn, right? When you look at the property, is there an opportunity for you to then go in there and actually add some of this stuff inside the building? Or do you need to start building more structures, right? Or, or expand on the current facility to get it there? You know, ask yourself those questions, right? A lot of times it's a lot easier to downgrade, if that makes sense. So if you had something that was maybe, um, you know, mid services or world-class services, you can probably say, well, hey, I can come in, I can repurpose these locations, I can cut all these services out and now make it a limited stay. But nonetheless, you wanna look at the asset class and figure out what opportunities do you have to make this fit your business model. Now, after you do that, you, then you wanna look at the branding opportunity. So again, if it's self-owned and operated, that's fine, that's fine. But is there an opportunity, is it large enough that maybe Best Western or Red Roof Inn or the Wyndham or any of them are actually interested in coming in and branding this, this motel or this hotel, right? So you have to look, is there an opportunity for, again, for this to fit my, my business model? And then that last point there is going right back to the first, who am I targeting? Is it corporate travelers, is it military bases? And if so, what are the features? What are the brands that they are really looking for, right? And kind of cater your model to that. All right, now we're getting to the fun stuff. This right here is the fun stuff to me. I love the numbers, right? I'm, I'm a very analytical guy when it comes to financial statements and running formulas. And this is the part where I was mentioning is actually very similar, very similar to hotel investing, I'm sorry, and to apartment investing by looking at the numbers. So when we look at annual revenue, this would be equivalent to gross potential income if you're going to be evaluating an apartment complex, okay? This is basically saying, hey, hey how much money is going to be coming in uh, to this property? How much money through all income sources, okay? Then we have to look at the way we're going to calculate that is basically figuring out what is the average daily rate right? In addition to any of the other additional services that we may have, and we'll touch on that very briefly with the uh, value add opportunities at the bottom. But what's the average daily rate seasonality wise, right? Let's predict it. So quarter one, we're looking at, you know, $65 a night. Great. Quarter two, 70, you know, quarter three, 68, so forth and so on. You can quickly look at potential annual revenue or potential uh, income based on the daily rate and the seasonality. Now, we have to, now we subtract vacancy before expenses, right? Just like apartment complexes. We have our potential gross income, 
then we subtract our vacancy to get our effective gross income, right? So we're gonna look at our occupancy rate for hotels. Now the occupancy rate on a national level is anywhere between 55 and 65%, okay? And that's fine, you could try to use that national um, average there, but then you must understand that hotels operate very differently depending on the geographical location, right? I guarantee you a hotel next to um, a national football stadium it's probably going to operate a little bit different than something in the in the middle of the sticks, you know, in the middle of the countryside, right? The occupancy rate is probably going to be a little bit higher. So ideally, you'll be able to look at the performance of the property. You'll be able to look at their financial statement, you know, their profit and loss statements and say, okay, well, I understand what the vacancy rate was. I can now take an average of their past three years vacancy rate to give me a good idea of where we're at. But like we said, a lot of times we're looking for distressed properties, right? Maybe something that's kind of out of whack. Maybe it's not performing that well. Or maybe the owners just did a really horrible job with their accounting, which happens more often than not. So then the question comes up, well, how do you figure out a good occupancy rate? Well, the way I like to do it is I look at one of two factors or both. But what in this general market location is the lowest occupancy rate in the past three years? Then what in this general location, what is the lowest occupancy rate in the past 10 years? Okay. Obviously, you guys are aware that 10 years, the economy will see many ups and downs. The three years, not so much. But in the past three years, as long as nothing drastic happened, it'll give you a general idea of how the market is performing. So by using those two, if you wanted to use the worst of the two or the lowest occupancy rate between the two, you can have that be your parameter for a very conservative approach to underwriting to determine value, okay? Then from there, you're gonna be looking at your value add opportunity. So now we have our potential gross income minus our vacancy. That gave us our effective gross income. Great. Then we can use the expenses, right, given up to us from the profit and loss statement from there to give us essentially what we like to call our net operating income, right? So you understand where you're at with that. Well, we're also looking at value add opportunities, opportunities to increase the potential of the property. We're looking at everything. So one of the most commonplace ones is going to be improving management, just operational efficiencies across the board, right? Can we decrease our utility expenses by putting in energy efficient light bulbs, for example, right? Can we actually put CapEx and replace our HVAC systems, our cooling systems to decrease our energy output there, right? And what's going to be the break even point on that? How do we decrease our expenses through salary or reducing some of the services that we provide, ultimately increasing that NOI, that net operating income, right? Can we add things like vending machines, right? That's very low service, same as ATMs. Can we add either one of those where we don't really have to service them? There's a third party who services them, but we get to collect a portion of the profit. So really we haven't reduced or we haven't increased our overhead at all, okay? Or laundry facilities. Does it make sense for us to put maybe coin operated or card operated laundry facilities somewhere on site, right? To increase our bottom line, to increase our revenue, okay? So all these different things are how we actually analyze the properties. And now the last bullet there is extremely important because I see a lot of newer investors, they'll come in and they'll evaluate a property based on the listing brokers or the sellers pro forma which is essentially projected performance, how it can do in its best light, okay? Now, when you do things like that, understand that it's in their best interest to make this property look like gold, okay? That's not always the case. We always recommend that you look at the past performance, the actual profit and loss statements, right? The actual balance statements, the actual tax reports and things of that nature. So you can have a full understanding of how it's performing and where you can improve it. When you don't have those documents, that's when we go back and we start to look at the potential annual revenue, average daily rate, occupancy rates, and we start to, to use some of the worst case scenarios just so our underwriting is a bit more conservative.
So now we've analyzed the property. We I found our ideal market. We know exactly what we're going for. Now, how do we buy it, right? There are a few different acquisition styles. Uh, the SBA loan is a very unique concept, uh, or this is one of the ways that it differs uh, from a lot of the apartment buildings, is because a hotel is, is an actual business. It is truly a business. So an SBA, or a small business association, they will provide loans for owner-operators to actually acquire them. Now, with that being said, typically you do have to have a certain level of experience, um, certain capital requirements, net worth requirements, and things of that nature. But nonetheless, this will allow uh, an individual to go in and acquire a hotel with very little money out of their pocket comparatively uh, to traditional financing. Okay, so this is a style. Another one would be a 1031 exchange. And for those who are not aware of that, that's essentially um, you're selling off one asset and you're looking to protect the capital gains from that sell. And so you give it to a 1031 intermediary and they help you transfer those entire capital gains into the new property so you can defer your taxes, okay? The very common strategy, but typically you're gonna need quite a substantial amount in that 1031 exchange for it to truly matter. But nonetheless, that's another option. The private placement offering or syndication is exactly what Sean was uh, referring to in the beginning of the presentation. This is essentially where a group of investors pull together under one common LLC to acquire the property. Okay, there's a couple of different filings. It's not extremely important to, to understand the difference between the two right now, but understand that you do, there is one where you have to be fully accredited and there's some stipulations for that. And there's ones where you can be non-accredited, all right? And there's some stipulations for that. The biggest thing to understand about this specific model is that you can use something like a self-directed IRA to participate in a syndication or a private placement offering. And so this may be your opportunity to find uh, a hotel and come in as a limited partner, right? To allow the general partners in the management team to really kind of handle the asset. And then you get passive income on the side. The next one is a loan assumption. The loan assumption is if there's already current financing in place, just like you would with any other residential property or any other commercial asset, you can go in and qualify through the current lender to then just assume the loan where it stands. And so the beautiful part about that, let's just say conceptually, let's talk regular home mortgages here. Let's say you got a 30 year fixed mortgage. You've lived in the house for 10 years. And now all of a sudden you wanna sell it and you end up doing a loan assumption to the new buyer. So the buyer assumes your 30 year fixed mortgage. Well, the beautiful part is the buyer now has 10 years worth of equity built into that loan, okay? So as you all are aware, when a loan is amortized, those first initial payments are pretty much all going to interest, all right? All going to interest and you slowly start to eat away at the equity and somewhere around that 20 to 15 year mark, then the payment changes where now the majority of the payment goes towards the equity. But when you assume a loan as the buyer, you're already getting that amortization schedule chalked down by however many years. So now your payments are going to a majority of the equity. So a loan assumption can be a beautiful strategy if you acquire it at, a, at, at an ideal time, you build in some equity and then you can quickly refinance maybe within a few years or sell it, right? But you've actually eaten down more of the equity, which is also a very common strategy for people to do something like a 15 year or a 20 year amortization, which is actually very common in commercial real estate because more of those payments are going towards that equity pay down. It gives them a little bit more flexibility on the exit or on the sell, okay? And the last one is seller financing. I'm sure you guys are aware of that one. That's where the seller actually holds the note like the bank. And so you start making payments to the seller. Now, the beautiful part about this is we can actually combine a majority of these acquisition styles to get creative and give us the competitive advantage. So for example, we can have a, a private placement offering, right? A syndication where we're bringing in limited investors, but we're actually going to do a loan assumption 
on a current loan. And then we're going to raise the equity stake that we need to from our, from our limited investors. And then we're going to have a, a second position for seller financing on the back end, right? You can add all of these things together to make your offer more competitive or to make sure that your numbers actually work for you when you're looking for your rate of return. Okay, so the acquisition styles, they aren't standalone. The key is you want to get creative with how, how you're approaching these deals. Okay, so now we went through everything and we bought the property. How do we operate it? Okay, well, believe it or not, in property, uh, in most real estate investing, the idea or the concept of a property manager is highly sought after. Well, guess what? Hotels have the same thing. There are hotel management service companies out there that will provide general managers and handle all of the staffing and the day-to-day -day operations. Now, obviously they do come with a fee, but again, we're trying to be investors, putting our money places where our money is making money. We do not want a second job. So we actually use the service of hotel management uh, companies. The next, once or next, once we have that in place, how do we actually handle all of our limited partners, right? So let's just say this is a syndication or it can be a JV, but we just have roles and responsibilities laid out. Well, we always wanna provide monthly updates, what's going on, how's the property performing, and then we actually do quarterly reports. Now, the quarterly reports are much more of the financial deep dive. How is it actually performing, right? Uh, you know, you can give me an update, but let me see the financials. Let me see the lifeline of this uh, actual property. And then K1 distributions are essentially saying, hey, since you are an equity owner in this property, how much depreciation do you get to take towards your personal tax report, right? How much cash flow have you made from this property that you get to report for your personal tax report? That's what a K-1 distribution is. It essentially breaks down all the ownership of the property and says, okay, uh, individual investor or individual partner, this is what you owe the IRS or this is what you're going to get back as a benefit which is another beautiful thing about owning real estate, is just the simple fact that you get all the benefits, even as a limited partner of the cash flow, depreciation, potential appreciation, principal pay down, all of that, okay? Then we got our management in place. We're dealing with our investors, making them happy. We got to have a solid CPA, right? Or a tax professional, whether it's in-house or it's outsourced, somebody who understands how to review these monthly financial statements, help us put together these quarterly reports and actually issue out and produce those K-1 distributions. You have to have um, a solid financial accounting team because this is an actual business. This is a full operation, right? And, and that's how you should view any real estate investment. But in something like this, it is a standalone operation. And the way that we do it, it's a franchise model. So it is a true, true business. All right. And then lastly, the general partners. So general partners versus limited partners, kind of going back to that syndication model, a syndication will be comprised of limited and general. Limited partners are people who just contribute capital. They don't really have much decision power, but they are informed of everything that's going on. And there is a few dec decisive points where they have to contribute. But a general partner is essentially the day the day operations, right? they have to have their designated roles and responsibilities. Who's actually reaching out and updating the investors? Who's actually communicating with the management team on the ground? Who's actually communicating with the CPA and getting these quarterly reports and the, and the K-1 distributions put out, right? But once you have those roles and responsibilities established, then you have those third party uh, aspects in place. It's, it runs very efficiently, right? It runs very efficiently. Then you get to sit back, act as the CEO, and then dedicate or, or designate what changes need to be made, what uh, uh, improvements need to be made, and how you need to communicate with all parties. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more. We've, we've discussed on it a lot, but what are some of the differences between hotels and, and other real estate assets? So the similarities, like I mentioned on the last slide, real estate investing is a business. It is a business. So when you're looking at a business, how do you know if it's performing well or not, right? It's through the finances. It's through the financial statements. How cash heavy are they? What are their profit margins? How is their expense ratio, right? Those are the things that we're looking at 
when we're trying to figure out the financial health of a business. Real estate investing is the same way. So the beautiful thing is if you understand real estate investing, if you understand business, you can apply all of those same methodologies to hotels the same way, right? Business fundamentals apply across the board. We just talked about that, right? How do we increase income, decrease expenses, right? Reduce volatility and create a sustaining operation, a machine, right? Same concept. And then third, par third party property manager is highly encouraged, right? We don't expect anybody who invests in real estate to be the expert property manager. You want to hire the expert property manager. Same thing in business, right? The, the, the owners of an of a organization or people who started, they don't always operate in every component. They begin to hire employees, consultants, things of that nature to really scale their business. So it's the same concept there. So, so what are the primary differences? So occupancy rates are lower than the typical long-term rentals. By all means, you should be able to find and hotels, if they're, I'm sorry, not hotels, apartment buildings in the right locations where you can get occupancy rates above 90% all day long. And if they're lower, great, that's a distressed property. Guarantee, well, not guarantee, but nonetheless, you should be able to get it 85 to 90 plus within a very small matter of time. That's a long-term style of a rental. Short-term style of a rental to include Airbnb, vacation rentals, and hotels typically have lower occupancy rates or higher vacancy rates just by the nature of the business model, right? People come to stay for three to five days. They don't necessarily come for months at a time or years at a time, okay? Marketing platforms may vary a little bit. Uh, one of the most common ones for rentals would be something like Apartments.com, Zillow Rentals, Trulia, things of that nature. You could also do, depending on how large your property is, you could absolutely create um, a Facebook page independent for your for your apartment complex, or if you really wanted to, a Craigslist ad or something along those natures. But with with hotels, especially with the franchise model, it's typically uh, one platform right? Or different platforms that's all kind of centrally located. So when you're going to Best Western, you may go to bestwestern.com and then you can type in the exact location that you want to go to, right? And so then it'll populate all the franchise options that are available in that area. So the marketing platforms are going to vary a little bit differently and the franchise themselves are going to have their hands in the pie a little bit more about where you can, how you can market. Uh, we already mentioned that revenue is seasonal. Okay, so again, we've, we've touched on that summer versus winter. And then flexibility to adjust daily rates based on demand is something that is extremely popular, not only in hotels, but you'll see it in the Airbnb model as well, right? So let's just say, again, um, let's use the Charlotte market, for example. Let's say we have a hotel, you know, in uptown Charlotte. And although the, the rates may be seasonal, Let's say generally during quarter one, you know, anywhere between January and March, the average daily rate's $100 a night. Well, all of a sudden in 2022, for example, the Super Bowl says that they're going to be based in Charlotte, North Carolina, right? Well, now we have the ability to say, hey, well, during this time, instead of $100 a night, we're going to say it's $200 a night, right? So that's one of the primary differences is that we do have the flexibility to adjust it based on special events, demand you know what if you know the hotel market is just completely um overfilled and there's no supply but high demand we can change it right and we do have um uh platforms that help us to kind of determine uh, some of those daily rates just like uh airbnb does as well all right all right so we're wrapping it up here guys uh, summary, again, if we're ready to start investing in um, hotels, you first want to identify your ideal markets. You do want to pursue those distressed properties and owners. You have to analyze the performance metrics, figure out what works right for you. Biggest thing, guys, we want to acquire right, right? Let's get creative on that acquisition. And then we want to manage right. Let's put it, let's bring in the all-star, the first string team to manage it correctly from the go. Once we have that model, all we have to do is rinse and repeat and continue to acquire hotels. And bonus tip right here is build your team up front. 
one of the worst things or one of the biggest struggles or biggest uh, things that you may encounter is you may sit there and try to, you may find the right property, analyze it, and then you're ready to move forward. But all of a sudden you don't have your investors in line. You don't have your management team in line, your contractors in line, so forth and so on. And you may end up losing the deal or spending a lot of money trying to figure it out on your own as you're building that team. So build your team up front and then go for it. And I believe, yep, so the last slide there, guys, um, you, uh, Sean mentioned you guys are going to get a recording of this. So that's all of our uh, information there on our social media sites. Uh, but beyond that, Sean, that's, that's pretty much it for me. That's a wrap. That was a lot. That was like a fire hose of uh, Hotels 101. So that was amazing, Michael. Thank you so much for, for uh, sharing all that information with us. And uh, so for those of you that are listening to this live, we do have the questions box. So feel free to type in any questions you do have for uh, Michael. As I said, we have a few minutes um, that we can delve into the Q&A. And uh, so then we'll be able to, uh, as Michael said, we'll have the recording and, and uh, his contact information so that you can reach out uh, to discuss it more in depth. So. I'll open that up now, see if we have any questions out there. Okay, great. Um, yes, the uh, so we do have someone that joined late. The presentation will be emailed, so you'll get the PowerPoint slides as well as the uh, audio recording. Uh, what The next question is, Michael, what is the typical fee for hotel management as a percentage? So they gave examples, eight, 10, 20%. Absolute great question. I want you to think of the fees for hotel management very similar to apartment complexes. So it can be anywhere from 2% to 4%, but understand that that's just the management fee. That doesn't necessarily include payrolls, salaries, and things of that nature. So what we've actually found is once you compile it all together, it's actually very comparative to apartment complexes, roughly anywhere between that six to even sometimes 8% of your total expenses. I'm sorry, total income. I'm sorry, total income. Yeah, no, perfect. That works. And uh, what kind of returns can I expect in the hotel asset class? Absolutely. So when we're looking at our internal rate of return, we are targeting anything 15 plus. Again, we treat it very similar to apartment complexes, but we have found success exceeding 20% uh, IRR. IRR. Okay, great. Yeah, we do have a few questions around that. So we'll, we'll try to make sure we cover all the primary points here. Uh, next one is, what geographical areas do you prefer for investments? For hotels specifically, I enjoy the Georgia area, uh, more southeast general area, because I'm most comfortable with that region, right? So we're looking at Louisiana, Georgia, Florida, obviously North and South Carolina, um, areas like that. Okay, makes sense. And what is the oldest property range uh, you would consider? So in terms of age of the, the building itself, what, what's kind of the oldest you think is appropriate to look at? Yeah, that's a good question. So again, I would go back to what is my intended use of that property? So for example, I mean, I'm very comfortable going back to, you know, to the fifties, right? Forties, as far as the structure goes, as long as it's structurally sound, but understand that your project improvement plan is probably going to have to require a, a lot of capital, a substantial amount of capital to get it up to code, to now input, you know, the heating and cooling system, the duct work, uh, probably need to change all the windows, right? So a building for all intents and purposes can last a very, very long time, but how much work are you actually willing to put into it? Uh, so for us, you know, our, our one of our criteria is we stick roughly around 1970, 1980 as the, as the backbone like that's pretty much as far as we want to go simply because we know anything beyond that it's just going to require a lot of capital now if the if the opportunity is there and you know we had the discussion and we had the capital for it we might but we like to pursue properties that are already cash flowing so if it's something where we have to put in a year's worth of improvements before we can cash flow eh, maybe not so much mm. yeah no that makes sense 
and uh, we'll try and get you out uh, with just the last couple here. Uh, so assuming this deal takes debt in addition to our equity, how does that debt affect the IRA rules? So that's a great question, really astute understanding that inside of retirement accounts, there are a couple of potential triggers for tax consequence for the purposes of this discussion. Uh, so ultimately, as Michael mentioned, the CPAs for the, for the, um, for the opportunity, for the entity that you're investing in, that's going to be critical, but also for each of the individual investors uh, having conversations with their tax professionals around possible tax ramifications. From a leverage standpoint, while the property is in use, there's typically not going to be a tax consequence from the, the leverage angle. However, as Michael said, these are largely considered operating businesses, essentially, that you're investing in. So there is a possibility for unrelated business income tax. So ultimately, again, it's really critical that you sit down with your CPA, uh, wh whether it's an investment inside or outside of your retirement account, to really get a full understanding of how they're going to analyze the cash flows and, and especially on the exit of the property. Michael mentioned the uh, fantastic technique of 1031 exchanges which even sometimes inside of retirement accounts can be useful tools. So astute question, but that was a long-winded way of saying we have to, as the third-party administrator, kind of punt to your, your, uh, your tax professional there. Um, and then, Michael, one more for you. So why did you pick hotels over apartments? That is a great question. I've been asked that quite a few times. So the primary reason is, as it stands now, anybody who is in real estate investing understands that apartment complexes are highly desirable. Everybody wants an apartment complex right now. So many individuals have opened up syndications, have opened up equity funds, have opened up just different ways of acquiring apartments. It has become the go-to asset class. So what we decided to do is we've had the resources, we had the team, we had the structure, but we wanted to go somewhere where the competition was a little bit less hectic. It gave us more opportunity. We're actually evaluating, you know, four or five hotels at any given time, all off market because it's such a small, unique approach. Another thing that is uh, Warren Buffett always says, when other people are fearful, you should be greedy. And when other people are greedy, you should be fearful. Well, people have been running away from hotels recently due to this year. And what we found is that it's not the hotel industry at large that's actually struggling. It is the mom and pop shops that are trying to run and operate hotels at a higher level. So it's a great opportunity for us to find these distressed properties, place in you know national hotel management services that are still operating at peak capacity during this entire event. So uh, we just found that unique opportunity and we, we decided to go for it. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, again, Michael, thank you so much. A lot of value here. Really interesting to, uh, for me personally, to start to understand what that asset class looks like. So a uh, lot of great information there. We got a lot of good feedback through the uh, questions platform as well. And so again, if you're interested in learning more about that hotel asset class, uh, Michael's information is here on the slide. That will be emailed to you along with a copy of the, uh, the recording of the audio as well. So, uh, again, thank you so much, Michael. Any any final thoughts to leave us with? No, I, I greatly appreciate um, the opportunity. And uh, ultimately, guys, uh, creativity is the is the answer to all, right? So, if you guys find an opportunity, just just be creative in your approach to it, and uh, you'll be surprised at some of the solutions that you can come up with. But I greatly appreciate it, Sean. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, and we can go from there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we will see you again soon in another webinar. Thanks a lot, and have a great day.